Let's lift our hands unto the Lord tonight. As we enter into praise and worship, we serve a worthy God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus. There is no problem that is too big for my God. There is nothing that he cannot do. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, God. Yes, nothing can separate us. No weapon formed against us can stand up to the name of Jesus.
just the same Yesterday, today, and forevermore No other name that could save, deliver, and restore Oh, Jesus, the same Yesterday, today, and forevermore There is no other name that is made Jesus Hallelujah, hallelujah Shotorabaikia truly serve an amazing God tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You can't fight this thing with your hands. You can't fight this battle with your feet. But you got to turn it over to the Lord because he's never been defeated in battle. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty. They're mighty through God, even pulling down of the stronghold. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
all across this room. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There's people in this sanctuary tonight that need to draw strength. Need to draw strength. This is your place of strength. This right here is your place of strength. I don't know what you're going to be facing tomorrow. I don't know what you're going to be facing on Friday. But tonight is your place of refreshing. It's the well where you can draw strength from. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we love him one more time? Hallelujah. God, I love you. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Prayer tonight. Sister Annie Bales is in need of healing. Sister Jenny Morell is in need of healing. Brother Bobby Parker is in need of healing. Sister Tina Coffee, Brother Kelvin Coffee, Sister Misty Coffee are all in need of healing tonight. Sister Barbara McCoy is in need of healing. Brother Klein says here he wants healing. He wants to be well enough to come to church. That's an easy thing for our God to do. There is nothing too hard for God to do. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands? Take one of these names before his throne tonight. Faith believing. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. God, we speak healing right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we thank him for healing tonight? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for it, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're asking this evening's ushers to come take up the offering. Give is given unto the Lord. Worship with Sister Scobie as she sings with us tonight.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Life is worth the living just because he lives. There's not another reason. Hallelujah. It's just because he lives. Hallelujah. What an awesome, awesome God. I love you, Jesus, so much. Thank you for the asobreato kaya Hallelujah. I've spent the last three days just overwhelmed with the glory of the Lord. And, uh, God has been speaking to me and uh, very expressly. And uh, I'm excited for this revival. I thank God for revival. I've been praying specifically for the altar. The sincerity of it, the need of it, and the purpose of it to be restored in our hearts and our spirit. And uh, I got to thinking as she was singing, we're a couple days past Resurrection Sunday. And if we want to be just symbolic and say that Jesus rose on Sunday, then Doubting Thomas is probably getting ready to find out that he really did raise up from the dead. And uh, so it's time for faith to be restored in our church. And uh, the altar is the only place that can happen. I've been asking God to give people the Holy Ghost at our altar. Amen. Thank God for what he did here Sunday night. precious soul this young girl was down here she'd never even been to a church before uh, like ours and she said I want the Holy Ghost and uh, she didn't even know what she's supposed to do I had to tell her you know close your eyes focus on the Lord now we're going to repent what's repent repent is to tell God you're sorry for your sins man Oh, how fresh. So fresh. Amen. Brother Chris, we're so glad you're here. And uh, without any further ado, we're going to turn this service to be orchestrated by you. And uh, we're glad you're here. Amen. It's uh, If the lights go out, uh, don't move. Amen. You might run over your neighbor. Hallelujah. I think we have some emergency lights here. So if the lights go out, follow the yellow brick road out the door. All right. Amen. Hallelujah. We're excited. Brother Chris is here. How many is ready to have a word from the Lord tonight? Take your liberty, elder, in Jesus. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Appreciate what the Lord is doing. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you wish. Amen. The presence of the Lord is always spectacular. Always precious. I don't really know that it's possible to uh, measure it better or worse one day from another, but it sure seemed today that he was especially close. And uh, I appreciate him, don't you? Amen. Abraham prayed for the day. God would give him a son.
then came the day who would have dreamed God would say give him altar here he lay most of us I dare to say
how I made it through the storm. I can't boast of any special power. There's no I just held on. I held on till the storm was over. I don't claim to be a hero. I don't have all the answers, but I held on till the storm was over. Not because I'm good, not because I'm great, not because I'm strong. I held on. Till the storm was over I don't claim to be a hero I don't have all the answers But I held on Till the storm was over Not because I'm good Not because I'm great Not because I'm strong I just held on I can tell things are finally happening. I've got blessings I can call my own. Many times I'd wonder if I could still make it. But while I was wondering, I was still holding on. I held on. I don't claim to be a hero I don't have all the answers But I held on Till the storm was over Not because I'm good Not because I'm Not because I'm strong I just held on I held on Things are finally happening. I've got blessings I can call my own. And many times I'd wonder if I could still make it. But while I was wondering, I was still holding on. I held on. I don't claim to be a hero I don't have all the answers But I held on Till the storm was over Not because I'm good Not because I'm great Not because I'm strong I just held on time like this my vision severely contradicts my spirit and so you know what I'm going to do tonight I'm just going to quit looking praise God I'm telling you if I've ever felt God has directed my spirit and I feel it tonight and I would just ask you to look beyond the logistics. And let's just feel after the spirit of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to turn with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 2. And read uh, the 
just a few verses out of chapter 2 and chapter 3. Could I get a little bit more monitor, please? Amen. Praise. I want to hurt. I don't want to hurt y'all's ears, but I want to hurt mine. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. <clears throat> be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. One translation said, my people have committed a compound sin. They walked out on me. The fountain of fresh flowing waters and then dug cisterns. Cisterns that leak. Cisterns that are no better than sieves. And he said, stand in shock, heavens, at what you see. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. Read 6 through 8 and then drop down to verse 12. Jeremiah 3 and 6, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister, praise, I mean Judah, saw it. And I saw it. When for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister, Judah, feared not but went and played the harlot also. Drop down to verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backslide in Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord. And I will not keep anger forever. It's real simple, folks. Only acknowledge. That's it. You don't have to fix nothing. If I'm not careful, I'll get the cart for the horse tonight, but it's real simple. You don't have to fix anything. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. More than words, I want you to capture the attitude of God speaking through the prophet when he says, Turn! Right. Turn! Oh, backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you. He that put her away, he that gave her a real divorcement, said, Return unto me, for I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, I will bring you to Zion. I want to preach to you tonight from this subject, the betrayed husband, Pastor Richard. God, I'm asking you to anoint our ears that we might hear the word of the Lord. Let 
us go into a place, God, that you would have us go into in this message. Give us the word, God, that we might hear it and that we might do it as well. And become doers of the word as our prayer and our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to say up front tonight that this message, although the title says, the betrayed husband. This message is, is not gender specific. But for the sake of getting the point across that I'm talking about, uh, I have chosen to make it thus. Would you stay with me for a little bit? I simply cannot fathom the roiling and turbulent Emotions of a husband betrayed. In my years of being in the people business, I've sat in many a place of business, such as a restaurant or the like. You know I sit in restaurants more than I do anything else probably. But uh, I know what it is to watch a daddy sitting at a table with his children. And after a while, it would become obvious that it was just a dad trying to make the most out of limited time getting to spend with his children. And it wouldn't be long until a vehicle would pull up and a man and a woman get out. Children would give daddy goodbye hugs and kisses complete with promises to see them again soon. That really doesn't even move us much anymore because, uh, after all, it's commonplace today. And while sad, everyone just accepts it as that's just the way life is. And I know that it happens to mothers as well as dads. But for the sake of where I'm going, while the emotions are not inclusive of gender, for spiritual basis and foundation, I've chosen to focus on the dad. You can do the gender thing yourself. Praise God. I have at times observed the dad who possibly faced betrayal of the worst sort. Watch his wife and her new lover, husband, walk away hand in hand with his kids. And the emotions, though dulling possibly a little with time, is an ache that never completely goes away to know that somebody else thought by his children to be better than him. Richer than him. More able to make them happy than he. And uh, believing that stepdad, well, don't you hate that term, is better able to give them what they want. And as if that's not bad enough, the wife once pledged to him an eternal love, trust, Faithfulness found somebody she thought was better and more able to afford or give her what she thought she needed or desired. Speak air and me to do. Praise God. And it must be the apex of the zenith of the peak of torture to know. The things whispered in the seclusion and privacy of relationship with him were now whispered in the ear of a new lover. She has found someone she loves more than him. And she walks away, mincing, pouncing, walking. 
the picture of taking the children with her. And, and not just the children, but taking away his dreams, taking away his visions for them with her. More than just physical separation. It's violated purpose. It's betrayed trust. It's stolen intimacy. It's lovers under every green tree. And the relationship now is at best very rigidly cordial. I really can't even talk much because uh, things cannot be talked about without it erupting into rage and anger. Control issues always lurking just, just under the surface of every uh, interaction. You see, to violate family is to reach all the way back into the purposes of God. His eternally legislated unity violated just like the severing of the fruit in the Garden of Eden from its nurturing vine and the division that it propagated into God's creation, earning God's extreme displeasure. Not at picked fruit, but the heartbreak of relationship betrayal in that pure garden of divine fellowship. Somebody say Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is our Garden of Eden, folks. Hallelujah. How many nights did he moisten his pillow with tears of torment? Hearing in his mind the cruel words of finality from her, I wonder if his mind was in self-destruct mode as it would seem he it would seem he could hear things said and see things that his mind would torment him over. I wonder, I wonder if he could imagine the tittering laughter as she demeaned him to her new lover. I wonder if she came upstairs to the home they used to share and laughed at him as she told her new man how her ex-husband in our last conversation, she just begged and pleaded with me to come home with him. And she laughed, told me he still loves me. I, I don't have the articulation today, ladies and gentlemen, to make it as cruel and as emotionally traumatic and impacting as it really is. Hallelujah. Laughing, laughing at him. <laughs> he says he still loves me. He wants me to come home as if I could go back to the pathetic little guy. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I don't know if it's possible to describe the total grief in time, in time, as if all that is not bad enough, but in time to see her Bearing children that were not his. And to see that natural glow on the face from a distance. A glow that was not put there by him. To see the looks of malicious triumph from this man 
as though saying to him, look what I took from you, little fellow. You weren't good enough to keep her. I offered her better than you ever could. Come on, do I need to dwell on that? I, I don't think I need to dwell on that. You could never do for her what I'm able to do for her. And then to see the dismissive turn of the head and, and the change of direction and, and for them to walk away as if he as if he did not nor ever had existed. She didn't just take vision and dreams from him. She obliterated his very existence as if he had never been there. And, and I hope I'm not boring you tonight because I'm certainly not trying to entertain you. And to hear the tormenting peals of laughter from the children as he overheard them exclaiming in excited voices, what new place of amusement as stepdaddy was taking them. What new place of entertainment that they were going to. But daddy had never taken them, would not take them. Dreams destroyed. Hopes and destiny repealed and gone. Covenanted eternal vows obliterated and violated as if they were just, just empty and mere vain words. And while these words were true and faithful with him, they apparently were just words to her. I wonder how many others she'll play with before she's gone. Okay, stay with me. How much more betrayal will she engender because if she'll do that to him, she'll do that to somebody else. That's just the way it is. How much can her children take until... They just simply out of self-preservation decide that this is just the way life is. We see daddy once in a while and we live with mom. No biggie. Two sets of clothes, two sets of toys. I live here a while, I live there a while. When the unclean spirit is gone, not cast out, gone. Walketh about in dry places, seeking rest and finding none. Returns unto that house, finding it clean and decorated, but empty. And he brings back seven more that are worse than him. And the, and the latter end of that is worse than the first. You understand? Coming and going. Coming and going. With daddy a while, with mama a while. Out of church a while, in church a while. Out of church, but not really out of touch. You know, I really, I'm not trying to elicit huge emotional response out of you running the house, jumping up and down. I'm really not interested in anybody saying, Woo, good preaching. That's not, that's not in it. I just know that I've heard from the Lord today. Amen. Hallelujah. How much more can these children take? I mean, they're kids. They're coping. Kids are good at coping. But it traumatically impacts their lives in ways that they don't even understand until somewhere down the road they don't even recognize true relationship. They have no pattern. They have no precedent to establish in their mind what real relationship is. It's not just Israel. It's Israel's sister. Hauntingly beautiful, clear complexion, sparkling dark-eyed Israel, this raven-haired, gorgeous, symbolic wife, said to Jeremiah, who had watched her walk away, Jeremiah, who had put her away and gave her a writ of divorcement, 
And now she hears him pleading, come back to me. Somebody said, I, I, I wouldn't have done that. No, you, you may not have because I think there's something of the children traumatically impacted complex and our mentality that, that has affected us. Oh, okay. I think there may be a little bit of Judah, the treacherous sister that resides in us. And so we really don't know how to judge this thing. And so, but Jeremiah watches her walk away and he pleads with her, come back to me. Hear her laugh as she walks away with one of her many lovers saying, Listen to the weak old thing begging me to come back to him. And she backhands her lover on the arm and laces her hand through the crook of his arm and minces away, turning her back on God. The Lord said in Jeremiah 3, and I read it to you, verse 12 through 14, Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Only, only, it's a small thing. You don't even have to act like it never happened. There ain't nothing to fix. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Hear the wailing voice of God through the prophet again saying, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. I don't care where you've been. I don't care who or how many you've been with. I don't care about how many groves of idols under every green tree that you worship Baal and Ashtaroth in your sexual liaison. It doesn't matter. I'm married to you. I'm married to you. And I will take you to one of a city and two of a family. I will bring you to Zion. All you have to do, all you have to do is repent. All you have to do is acknowledge we have a generation today that seems like they have the inability to face up and confront their problems and acknowledge. And we're full of statements like it's nobody else's business. No, you're absolutely right. It isn't anybody else's business. Confessing in front of the church and everybody else isn't going to do anything for you. But acknowledging your sin to I mean in a, in, a, in, a, in a prayer closet or at an altar somewhere where you know. Where you know that there is no face saving. Where you know that you're talking to God. And there is no amount of posturing that's going to make your sin seem a little better. Or be appeased to God. Because with Him, it's I'm wrong. I have no excuse. I don't have anybody to blame. My hurts from other people ain't nothing. That's no reason. I kneel before you today, God, inexcusable. Inexcusable. That's all he said, dude. I hope some of you are not thinking, oh boy, did I come to church and brave the weather on Wednesday night for this? Well, it might not be for you then. But I know in the Holy Ghost that despite the smile on some of your faces, 
the Holy Ghost has dealt with me. And somebody needs to come back to him. There ain't no sense in looking at each other across this congregation and trying to figure out who it is. I done tried that. I can't figure it out either. I've tried to give logical space in my mind to preach this message, and I couldn't find it. All I could find was the Spirit of the Lord directing me. Hallelujah. Come back to me. I'm still married to you. You may have put it on the back burner, burner so back far in, 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 your, in your mind that you don't even remember, but I remember. Come on. I remember. I'm married to you. And Israel, as much as I love you, I'm, I'm telling you it's not just you. But when you started being unfaithful, wife, your treacherous sister Judah was looking on. And she started doing the same thing. Oh, I know. I ain't apologizing for nothing. You see, the name Israel means a prince that hath power with God. It means to rule with God. You know that Judah, Judah very basically means pray. The entire definition of Judah is this time. I will praise the Lord. But the core of the word means celebrated praise. you got to think with me a little bit, okay? You have violated and become unfaithful in your relationship with your espoused bridegroom. But the worst thing is not what you've done but what you've caused and what you've propagated. Because now your children that find out what happened and the rift and the separation and the divorce, now they have a different idea and concept in their own mind about normal relationship. And your children can't just go from that point on. Your children remember your praise, Judah. Oh, my God. And they know that this didn't happen overnight. So in their own minds, they're thinking, I saw Daddy praising God. I saw Mama dancing and shouting. And according to the time span involved here, they were doing that and they were unfaithful at the same time. They were gifted. But they were unfaithful. And God just let them shout on. And now it's not what they did, Bishop, but it's the children who have a skewed concept of what it really means to live for God. Your treacherous sister, Judah, started doing the same thing. You're praising God, but your praise is treacherous. I haven't come to bring a pall or a damp or, or a, a some sort but I have come to bring solemnity in the spirit of the Lord tonight I'd love to be that evangelist that every time I walk to the pulpit folk just shouted tore the chandeliers down just ran had a time but unfortunately tonight you have this kind of an evangelist and I'm not apologizing for that, but I want you to know I've seen treacherous praise before. Come on. Have you? I, want, I dare say that every one of us at one time or another, while we were praising God, something came before our mind. Oh, my God. How good you are, Lord. 
to allow me to feel his presence. And I've been so lost. You know what that is? That's God saying, come back to me. I'm married to you. Hallelujah. I've observed them and you have too. I'm faithful to God. Their praise has become treacherous. It's Tamar and Judah all over again. It's relationship without commitment. It's praise without commitment. We need to praise. We don't ever need to back off of praise. We don't ever need to back away from praise. But we need a foundation of acknowledgement and confession. And we need daily repentance in our heart. I said it the other day and I, I'm still saying it. We live to repent instead of repenting to live. God is trying to tell us today that he's still committed to us. I know you're in, in a very delicate, crucial time, literally, right now. But God is saying he's still committed to you. He's still committed to you. Pastor, there is no implied idea that you've done something wrong here. But I feel like the Lord said to tell you today, he's still committed to you. Hallelujah. He's still married. To the vision and the destiny that he put in your heart that you articulated to this congregation. He's still committed to you. Oh, let's love him right now, would you? What I told you is still going to happen. Do you hear me, my brother? What I told you is still going to happen. Open his mind, Lord, and clarify the vision in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. My sister, you were coming down the stairs as I was coming up the stairs out of prayer. And when I passed you, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm getting ready to stir her nest. I'm getting ready to stir the home. Get ready for a miracle. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. I hear the voice of the Lord pleading with a backslidden preacher. Oh, you missed it, preacher. Take it up with God. I'm not interested in your logistics. I'm not interested in your carnal reasoning. But I feel the Lord calling somebody. I feel the Lord calling somebody back to a place of committed relationship. You're not really physically doing anything, but your mind is active under every green tree of fantasy and imagination. I think you realize now that I'm not really talking about a literal betrayed husband or wife. I'm talking about our espoused bridegroom that is speaking to this 2016 apostolic church and he's saying come back to me I'm tired of your programs and your well thought well planned things and I'm tired I'm tired of excellence taking the place of anointing and that's not the case here that's not the case here 
But in general, as I travel, and your pastor travels, and he sees the same thing that I see. And God is saying, I'm tired of your giftings replacing my anointing. I'm tired of your talents. Amen. And your ability to harmonize with perfection and entertain the audience to where they don't know the difference between an emotional response and the power of anointing. And God is saying, in spite of your willful failures, our mistakes and stubbornness. He is issuing a clarion call today. Come back to me. Some of y'all ain't got a clue. Some of y'all might be tempted to think, boy, that preacher, he's worked up. It's, it's not a connection. But the Holy Ghost knows the connection that's supposed to be there. I sleep. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 2. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, and it's not just a quick rap on the door. Oh, she's not home. No. He knows she's there. He knows she's there. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. Undefiled. Oh, you didn't get that. You ain't got that. My undefiled. He's talking to people. He's talking to a bride that is not tainted, besmirched, smeared, undefiled, but unmoved. You look good, but your heart's not. My head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. You want to hear her response? You want to hear it? I, I have put off my coat. And how shall I put it on? I'm ready for bed. I, I've washed my feet. If I get out of bed to go to the door, I will dirty my feet. And as if that rejection was not enough. You know he had to hear that. You know he heard her excuses related to her, the violation of her personal convenience. And, and the book said, and, and this is her perspective, her perspective now. She said, my blood. Wow, she recognized that, didn't she? My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. And you know what that is. That's where the latch string on the, during the daylight hours, the latch string was through the hole and on the outside of the door. They didn't have locks like we do. Quick set hadn't even been thought of. Passage locks were non-existent. They just had a string that dangled outside the door, came inside, went up through a pulley, and came down to a bar. When you pulled the string, the bar lifted. You could go in. At nighttime, they pulled the string inside the door so nobody could get in but my blood. He knew how impossible it was. He knew that it was going to take my response to open the door. He knew, yet in spite of knowing, he, he tried to run his finger in the hole. 
He tried to capture the latch string, and if it could have hit him, he'd have pulled it to the outside and hit, hit God in, and he would have. But, but he knew that it was going to take her to open the door. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. In my bowels, my heart was moved for him. Some way there is an injection of time here that is not really talked about. It's implied. And she said, I rose up to open to my blood. And I touched the door where he had ran his hand through that hole in the door. And, and my hand dropped with myrrh. My fingers were sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. And I opened to my beloved, and my beloved had withdrawn himself. Nobody ran him off. He just knew that my response was not equated to his love. She didn't say, go on, leave me alone. She just did not immediately respond. Oh, my God. She just didn't immediately respond. And the hesitation in response, the hesitation in response, I don't know how long it was, but it was there because when she finally opened the door, he had withdrawn himself and was gone. And all she had left was a fragrance of his cologne on her hands. Don't you understand? All she had left was the fragrance of a past presence. I'm pleading with a modern apostolic church today to understand. Amen. She went out and she said, my soul failed when he spake, and I sought him, but I couldn't find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Hesitation, fatal hesitation. My God, my God, amen. But at this point, now, here, hallelujah, Wednesday, March 30th, 2016, God of heaven, at this point, the lover of our soul, our espoused bridegroom, is pleading with us before it's too late, standing outside the door of our heart, knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove. He is calling out to those who walk at a distance. They're not out, but they're not in. Hallelujah. They're too in to be out, and they're too out to be in. Come on. And he's pleading today. He's pleading today. They walk at a distance. Come on, music. i, I got to close. There they are, Pastor. There they are, walking. They're with us. They're here. We see them. They're faithful. But they're hesitant. And they walk at a distance, plodding, trudging their slow but sure way to judgment upon the broad highway named the idolatry of self. It's times like this I see every mistake I've ever made. It's times like this I am so graphically aware of every boneheaded failure I've ever done. But I hear him saying, come back to me. And I wonder, could he really mean that because of what I've done? Because of what I'm guilty of? Could it be true? Could it be true that he really means that? You better embrace it. Because your sister's watching. 
I wonder, would Judah have been so treacherous if Israel would have just acknowledged and accepted the embrace of her espoused bridegroom? And I wonder today, oh, I wonder today, I'm wondering out loud, I wonder today if your children, your brothers, your sisters, your family, your friends would have a more accurate concept of a relationship with God if you just come back to Him. Just come back. How can you love me? I'm, I'm still married to you. I'm still married. Oh, Pastor. Pastor. I hope tonight I'm not a mystery. I preach and I beat myself over the head wondering did I pray enough did I study enough is there something that I can do to me but there isn't anything I can do but obey God that's it so tonight the letter's on your desk the letter's on your table come on letter after letter has come before you the attorneys with, you know, the accuser, the brethren, the attorney, saying, I don't want to be with you no more. Sign these papers so we can go on. Oh, my God. Young lady. My God. You don't look as good leaving as you do. Coming. Young man, your commitment and your consecration to God is the most beautiful thing in this world. I know thoughts running, roiling in your mind, turbulent, storms of the spirit in your mind, carnality fighting the spirit. Let the devil convince you that if you really had the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't have done that. Don't, 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 don't. Let the devil devalue your Holy Ghost and deceive you into thinking that if it was really the real thing, I wouldn't have thought that. I, I wouldn't have felt that. I wouldn't have done that. Because if he can deceive you, about the real thing, then you're not going to have anything to compare to. You'll spend the rest of your life looking for the real thing and it'll be as elusive as quicksilver in your hands. I'm come to tell you, young people, saints of God, what you've got is the real thing. Now hear the voice of the Lord saying, come back to me. I'm still married to you. Yeah, but you don't know what I've done, Lord. Yes, I do. Yes, I do know what you've done. I've had my eye on you the whole time. I don't want to judge you, Tamar. I don't want to judge you, Gomer. I just want to tenderly and gently help you down off the auction. I just want to take you home with me. Stand. Come. If I'm the only one, then maybe I just preached to myself tonight. And if that's the way it is, I'm okay with that. Somebody needs to make up their mind. 
Hey, son, before you kneel, I heard you pray in the night. I wasn't paying attention to what you said, but I heard the timber of your prayer. God's going to use you, son. God's going to use you. You stay hungry for that bridegroom, will you? Will you? Will you stay hungry? Will you stay hungry for that bridegroom? Will you? God's going to use you, buddy. He's going to use you, buddy. You will be as anointed over the pulpit as you are anointed in your prayer. And that's thus saith the Lord. Carry your emotions from prayer to the afforded opportunities of the pulpit that is given to you. And God will always use you. Come on, does somebody hear the voice of the Lord tonight? Do you hear it? Do you hear the voice of the Lord? Do you hear it? Come back to me. Come back to me. I'm still married to you. Come, come back to me. Come back to me. I'm afraid you don't love me like you used to because I don't hear you tell me much anymore. Is there somewhat, is, is, is there something of the of the, the old comic caricature? You know, do you still love me? Well, well, yeah. Well, you don't tell me anymore. Well, if I ever stop loving you, you'll be the first one to know. Boy, that's a truth. That may be a cartoon and that may be a funny, but that's a truth. Because when you don't love him, he's the first to know. He's the first to know. That's why, that's why he burdens pastor. That's why pastor weeps and cries and wails in a prayer. That's why the Lord loves you, understand. That's why your leader weeps and cries. That's why, that's why even the music feels the heartbeat of what's going on. And, and their music flows in that river. Come on, your leadership, your your your, your praise team, your praise team leader. Come on, I hear a voice. Oh, I hear it. I know. I know. My, my flesh is in in conflict with my spirit. My spirit's telling me there ain't a thing you can say more. But my flesh still wants to plead. My flesh still wants to beg. Please come. Please come. Come back to me. Come back to me. I'm still married to you.
tonight. Jesus, we love you. We rededicate ourselves to you, coming back to you, Lord, running back to you, Lord, putting ourselves into you, Lord. Whatever you need us to be, to do, God, we are going to be that, and we are going to do that. In Jesus' name, we believe it. We thank you for it, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. As we go tonight, amen, let's go with a burden for the lost and reach out to somebody this week that needs God. And uh, that can be a new person. That can be somebody that's a backslider. Just invite them to church. You don't have to go do a Bible study. Just ask them to come to church this weekend. Sunday morning, Sunday night, we'll be in church. There is no service here Friday, and uh, there will be no here service here tomorrow. It's just this week is Wednesday and Sunday morning and Sunday night. And uh, let's come back ready to receive something from the Lord and bring somebody out to the kingdom of God this weekend. Amen? Amen. Be mindful of those that are still praying. Amen. You're dismissed tonight in Jesus' name. 
Shake hands with somebody around you unless you think that they've been sick lately. And then in that case, just avoid them and tell them you love them on the distance. Amen. That's a joke. Amen. Pray for all these people that are sick. Also, there's a request that was asked of me that I didn't make. Uh, Sister Jenny Coffey asked this church to pray for her. She said she is uh, having migraines, which is causing stroke-like symptoms. And she's scared, uh, obviously, why uh, she's just having that stroke. She said, I'm very nervous. I'm very scared. Please have the church pray for me that I would get better. So uh, keep Jenny Coffey in your prayers as you go. I forgot to put that request in uh, when Brother Matt was doing prayer requests. So uh, all of you that are prayer warriors that pray before you go to bed, say her name before you go to bed. All of you that pray when you get up in the morning, say her name when you get up in the morning. All of you that don't pray except when you come to church, pray for her Sunday night before you start church. And uh, we love you. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen.